provided by the Annenberg CPB project. Additional funding was provided by the Chubb Group of Insurance Companies for over 100 years providing business and personal insurance worldwide through independent agents and brokers. Was the world on the brink of a holocaust? Was it our error, a mistake? Was there something further that should have been done or not done? His face seemed drawn, his eyes pained, almost gray. We stared at each other across the table. I felt we were on the edge of a precipice with no way off. There is uh, no experience like gazing down the nuclear gun barrel at the other side and realizing that everything you stand for and have dreamed of and have hoped for could be blown up. Nuclear weapons have overshadowed our lives. Even today, there are enough nuclear explosives to kill every man, woman, and child on the planet. But only once, 30 years ago this October, was the world gripped by a very real fear of nuclear war. The Cuban Missile Crisis was triggered by a series of miscalculations and mistakes that brought the United States and the Soviet Union to the brink of mutual annihilation. The fall of 1960, John Fitzgerald Kennedy campaigned for president. The seeds of the Cuban crisis were being sown. Kennedy campaigned as a tough, cold warrior, the man who would confront the Russians everywhere in what he called a global battle for survival. I have strong ideas about the United States, playing a great role in a historic moment. When the cause of freedom is endangered, all over the world, when the United States stands as the only sentry at the gate, when we can see the campfires of the enemy burning on distant hills. Looking right at the camera here. Do that again. Take care of again, Candy. In a debate with his Republican opponent, Richard Nixon, Kennedy charged that a missile gap had emerged, that America had fallen behind the Russians in the race for nuclear superiority. I believe the Soviet Union is first in outer space. We have, may have made more shots, the size of their rocket thrust, and all the rest. You yourself said to Khrushchev, you may be ahead of us in rocket thrust, but we're ahead of you in color television. I think that color television is not as important as rocket thrust. His counterpart in the crisis was Chairman Nikita Sergeyevich Khrushchev, the leader of the Soviet Union, determined to confront the U.S. on the Cold War battlegrounds to make his country a superpower second to none and a beacon to revolutionary struggles throughout the world. To Americans, Khrushchev personified the image of the communist menace. Brash, bumptious, threatening. We live on Earth not by the grace of God and not by your grace. In a provocative speech at the UN, Khrushchev proclaimed his support for what he called wars of national liberation. Cuba was to become a case in point. Down with colonialism, the sooner we bury it and the deeper the better. That same day, Khrushchev cemented an alliance with Fidel Castro, a leader of a successful revolution on the island of Cuba and a star prodigy of the socialist movement. Khrushchev promised Castro that the Soviet Union would actively support Cuba, the first such alliance in the Western Hemisphere. 
Cuba had once been a favorite vacation spot for Americans. Now, allied with the Soviet Union, Castro's Cuba would become the crucible of the newly elected American president. I, John Fitzgerald Kennedy, do solemnly swear that you will faithfully execute the office of president of the United States. January 20th, 1961, Kennedy took office with a strong warning to Khrushchev and the Soviet Union. America would not tolerate the spread of communism in America's backyard. Let all our neighbors know that we shall join with them to oppose aggression or subversion anywhere in the Americas. And let every other power know that this hemisphere intends to remain the master of its own house. Less than three months after taking office, Kennedy approved a secret CIA plan begun under President Eisenhower to overthrow Castro's revolution. April 17, 1961. 1,400 Cuban exiles, secretly trained and equipped by the CIA, landed at the Bay of Pigs on Cuba's southern coast. The CIA expected the invasion to trigger a popular uprising inside Cuba but they underestimated Castro's strength. There was no uprising, and the invasion was a miserable failure. There's an old saying that uh, victory has a hundred fathers and defeat is an orphan. And, I think uh, it was the first thing he ever really lost, and he felt pretty bad. He felt like he wasn't sure that Alan Dulles of the CIA and the Joint Chiefs thought the plan was as good as they uh, told him it was, and he also thought that maybe they believed that a, a man that had been president less than three months could start off with a failure. Cuba celebrated, but the Bay of Pigs invasion and subsequent attempts to assassinate Castro convinced the Soviets and the Cubans that the U.S. was bent on destroying the revolution. Cuba had become an icon of the superpower conflict. Premier Khrushchev arrives in Vienna for the first summit meeting with a U.S. president since the ill-starred conference with President Eisenhower in Paris. Two months later, still smarting from his fiasco at the Bay of Pigs, Kennedy flew to Vienna for what turned out to be a tense and hostile summit meeting with Nikita Khrushchev. It was their first opportunity to match wits, and both resorted to brinksmanship. Khrushchev threatened to sever Western access to Berlin, the symbol of divided post-war Europe. Kennedy refused to give ground. Mr. Khrushchev said, if there's any attempt on the part of the West uh, to interfere with these arrangements, there will be war. Well, now, in diplomacy, you don't use that word war very often. You talk about the gravest possible consequences or something of that sort. But Kennedy had to look Khrushchev straight in the eye and say, then, Mr. Chairman, there will be war. It's going to be a very cold winter. Within a few months, the threats made in Vienna took form in Berlin. Khrushchev built a wall dividing the city and tried to limit Western access to it. Americans responded by brandishing their larger and better deployed arsenal of nuclear weapons. The president and the free world uh, are willing to use nuclear weapons to uh, preserve our position in uh, Berlin to ensure that the people of Berlin remain free and that we have access to that city. Uh, you would then perhaps use nuclear weapons in connection with the Berlin situation? Yes, sir. we will use nuclear weapons whenever we feel it necessary to protect our vital interests. Our nuclear stockpile is several times out of the Soviet Union. We will use either tactical weapons or strategic weapons in whatever quantities, wherever, whenever it's necessary to protect this nation and its interests. Nuclear weapons had become the central tool of superpower diplomacy. During that 10th September of 1961, the Soviets tested the largest hydrogen bomb the world had ever seen. But they had only about six intercontinental missiles capable of striking the American mainland. The United States had hundreds of nuclear weapons capable of striking the Soviet Union from North America. 
and the United States also enjoyed a geographical advantage, with weapons based in allied countries much closer to the Soviet Union, Great Britain, Italy, and Turkey. Khrushchev was acutely aware of the U.S. nuclear advantages. With Berlin divided, the immediate crisis there dissipated. But in October 1961, in the Communist Party Congress in Moscow, Khrushchev was chastised by China for being soft in his dealings with the West. With his leadership of the communist world in jeopardy, Khrushchev was afraid to lose Cuba and was looking for a way to prop up his position there. As the Americans had done in Berlin, he decided to do it with nuclear weapons. Khrushchev explained in his tape-recorded memoirs. While I was on an official visit to Bulgaria, one thought kept hammering away at my brain. What will happen if we lose Cuba? We had to think of some way of confronting America with more than words. The logical answer was missiles. The United States had already surrounded the Soviet Union with its own bomber bases and missiles. We'd be doing nothing more than giving them a little of their own medicine. The Soviet Union had been shipping oil, agricultural equipment and technicians to Castro's Cuba for several years. But in the late summer of 1962, Soviet troops and military equipment arrived on the island at an increasing rate. Alexander Alexeyev was Soviet ambassador to Cuba. It was clear that the United States was preparing to invade Cuba, so he sent in more military supplies, planes, MiGs, Soviet military advisors, and finally, we and the Cubans decided that in order to avoid a United States invasion, we should supply Cuba with missiles. We were not too pleased with the missiles, actually. If it had been a matter only of our own defense, we would not have accepted the emplacement of the missiles here. But don't think that this was because we were afraid of the dangers that entail the emplacement of the missiles here, but rather because this would damage the image of the revolution. And we are very zealous in protecting the image of the revolution throughout the rest of Latin America. And the presence of the missiles would in fact turn us into a Soviet military base, and that had a high political cost. Kennedy and his advisors dreaded the possibility that Cuba would become a Soviet base, but they could not imagine that Khrushchev would install nuclear missiles there. The Soviets had never placed missiles outside their own territory. On the other hand, Kennedy was concerned that the issue of Cuba might hurt the Democrats in the upcoming elections. He drew the line dramatically and forcefully. If at any time the communist buildup in Cuba were to endanger or interfere with our security in any way or become an offensive military base of significant capacity for the Soviet Union, then this country will do whatever must be done to protect its own security and that of its allies. Less than a month later, Kennedy's commitment to act would be tested. On Sunday, October 14, 1962, a U-2 reconnaissance plane left Edwards Air Force Base, California, to take high-level photos over western Cuba. In a field near the village of San Cristobal, the photographs clearly showed 30-foot-long, medium-range Soviet nuclear missiles. Although the missiles were not ready to fire, CIA experts predicted they soon would be. The missiles could hit almost half the U.S. mainland, including New York and Washington. Early Tuesday morning, Kennedy was shown the photos by National Security Advisor McGeorge Bundy. Uh, I do recall that when I uh, talked to the President in the morning, we got to that question, what do we do? And, uh, 
one or the other or both of us said, well, we'll probably have to take them out. That was our first reaction. Bundy was instructed by the president to assemble a select group of top-level advisors to meet in secret session that morning. The group became known as the Executive Committee of the National Security Council, the XCOM. One of the first questions addressed by the group was whether the missiles in Cuba endangered the massive American advantage in nuclear weapons. While the Joint Chiefs of Staff thought the missiles were a military threat, Defense Secretary Robert McNamara disagreed. The meetings were secretly tape recorded by Kennedy with a microphone under the table. What is the strategic impact on the position of the United States of MRBMs in Cuba? How greatly does this change the strategic balance? I thought it changed the strategic balance, but I said substantial. My own personal view is not at all. The XCOM members knew that even without missiles in Cuba, the Soviets could already destroy major American cities with intercontinental missiles and missile-carrying submarines. They say it doesn't make a difference if you get blown up by an ICBM flying from the Soviet Union and one from 90 miles away. Geography doesn't mean that much. Kennedy and McNamara felt that the missiles were as much a political problem as a military threat, an unacceptable provocation. At one point, Kennedy regretted having committed himself to act if the Soviets installed offensive weapons in Cuba. The transcript of the meeting continues. President Kennedy, last month I should have said that we don't care. What difference does it make? They've got enough to blow us up now anyway. After all, this is a political struggle as much as military. Defense Secretary McNamara added, I don't believe it's primarily a military problem. It's primarily a domestic political problem. I didn't believe that the introduction of the weapons shown here or shown on the other uh, photographs would change the military balance between East and West. But I did believe then, and I do believe now, that it was a politically unacceptable move. We could not allow this hemisphere to become a base for offensive uh, Soviet forces. It was the political consequences that were the most urgent thing. That is, if the Soviets could change or alter the balance by the rapid secret deployment of nuclear weapons this is just not acceptable in the nuclear age the political consequences would have been enormous the effects on berlin on western europe on all of our allies so it was the political consequences that i think concerned us most of all the decision made to get the missiles out of cuba the XCOM then faced the question what action should the u.s take the first option considered was an all-out invasion of Cuba. Remembering the Bay of Pigs disaster, Robert Kennedy agreed that limited military action would be a serious mistake. Robert Kennedy then suggested that the U.S. create a pretext for an invasion by staging an action against the U.S. base in Cuba at Guantanamo Bay, or by sinking a U.S. ship, as was done in 1898 when the U.S. entered the Spanish-American War. I think Bobby Kennedy, in my presence, kept reflecting the, the view that this was the watershed crisis uh, of the Kennedy administration, a time of truth, chance to redeem himself from clear, clearly what had been mistakes in the Bay of Pigs, but that it was essential that he do so in a way that would leave his brother to go down in history as a hero and a moral leader for the United States. As the meetings continued throughout the week, other members of the XCOM, including former U.S. Secretary of State Dean Acheson and CIA Director John McCone, argued strongly for a second option, a quick airstrike to take out the missiles before they became operational. Uh, Dean Acheson came into one of our meetings uh, over in the State Department. He came out in favor of the airstrike by the U.S. Uh, uh, against the missiles in Cuba. He was then asked, what would the Soviets do in response? Oh, he said, I know the Soviets pretty well. 
I believe they would uh, feel obligated to respond by knocking out uh, U.S. missiles in Turkey. Well, someone said, what would we do in response to that? Oh, he said, under the NATO uh, treaty, we'd be obligated to respond by attacking uh, Soviet missiles inside the Soviet Union. Well, then what would they do, he was asked. Well, he said, by then we hoped that uh, cooler heads would prevail and we'd all sit down and talk. I can assure you it uh, was not uh, too cool in our meeting room at that time. A more moderate alternative was to initiate a naval blockade of Cuba and then threaten an invasion or airstrike if the missiles were not removed. An entirely different approach was to refrain from military action and negotiate with Khrushchev. The strongest advocate of this alternative was United Nations Ambassador Adlai Stevenson. He argued that the U.S. should trade Guantanamo Bay and American Jupiter missiles in Turkey for the Soviet missiles in Cuba. Though the United States had considered removing the vulnerable, obsolete Jupiters in Turkey for over a year, the XCOM rejected Stevenson's proposal as too much, too soon. On Thursday, October 18th, Soviet Foreign Minister Andrei Gromyko arrived at the White House for a previously scheduled meeting with President Kennedy. He was clearly nervous, though outwardly he tried not to betray it. He made contradictory statements. Threats toward Cuba were followed by assertions that Washington didn't have any plans for an assault on Cuba. And during that meeting with Mr. Gromyko, uh, President Kennedy, who was sitting there with a desk full of photos of the missile sites in Cuba, gave Mr. Gromyko every opportunity, in effect, to confess to the presence of these missiles. But Mr. Gromyko um, simply uh, played it with his usual poker face and insisted that there were only defensive weapons uh, in Cuba. Kennedy never raised the question of the presence of Soviet missiles in Cuba. I repeat, he never mentioned it. Thus, I didn't have to give a direct reply as to whether there were such weapons in Cuba or not. On Friday, day four of the crisis, low-level reconnaissance aircraft over Cuba brought back ominous new evidence. The photos revealed a site for a much longer-range Soviet missile, which could hit 98% of the U.S. mainland. Soviet technicians were working round the clock, pressing to get the missiles operational before they were discovered. Faced with this new evidence, Kennedy felt forced to act. That day, he secretly ordered the armed forces to prepare for action, and the Navy to impose a blockade, a line beyond which ships carrying arms would not be allowed. It was a plan McNamara had analyzed with Roswell Gilpatrick. I took the part of the Soviet planner, McNamara took the part of the U.S. planner, and, and we, we sort of, uh, we just war-gamed each other there with, uh, on the back of the envelope at our lunch table. And uh, what, what we essentially uh, came up with was this idea of a, of a naval blockade and, and uh, downplaying it so we weren't going to unless we had to seize or fire at Soviet vessels, but to, to um, show in as many ways we could, including mobilizing forces, moving forces around overtly, that uh, we, were, we were very serious about this um, installation of medium-range missiles in Cuba. Monday, October 22nd, day seven. As huge mobilization and deployment were taking place, Kennedy broke the news to the American people and announced his chosen course of action. Good evening, my fellow citizens. This government, as promised, has maintained the closest surveillance of the Soviet military buildup on the island of Cuba. Within the past week, unmistakable evidence has established the fact that a series of offensive missile sites is now in preparation on that imprisoned island. All ships of any kind bound for Cuba 
from whatever nation or port will, if found to contain cargoes of offensive weapons, be turned back. It shall be the policy of this nation to regard any nuclear missile launched from Cuba against any nation in the Western Hemisphere as an attack by the Soviet Union on the United States, requiring a full retaliatory response upon the Soviet Union. Well, I'd gotten home about 2 o'clock that evening because of a lot of things to do during uh, the evening following Kennedy's speech. And I got uh, three or four hours sleep, and I remember waking up the next morning and saying to myself, well, I'm still here. This is very interesting. Because that meant that Mr. Khrushchev's in immediate response was, had not been to launch nuclear missiles. Americans had uh, uh, missiles in Turkey, Italy, in other places in Europe. And uh, at the same time, we thought it was double standard. We thought it was double standard. In Moscow, the first reaction to Kennedy's speech was silence. It had not been reported to the Soviet people. But Khrushchev was surprised at the tough American stance. Khrushchev didn't expect such a reaction Khrushchev did not expect such a reaction from the Americans. I think, from knowing him personally, that Khrushchev did not take into account the consequences of his actions. What would the American response be? What would be our response to that? What would happen then? That's why John Kennedy's reaction was for Khrushchev. Unexpected. In Cuba itself, 100,000 men were put under emergency orders as they had been during past invasion scares. The waterfront in Havana and along other parts of the coast bristled with gun emplacements as the Cuban regime waited to see what their bosses in the Kremlin were to do. Castro has put every able-bodied man through military training. He went on to call President Kennedy a pirate for setting up the quarantine. The U.S. military was placed on the second highest alert, DEFCON 2. The Strategic Air Command put 57 nuclear-armed bombers in the air on round-the-clock missions. And on the Atlantic, 25 Soviet ships were on their way to Cuba. At the Pentagon's war room, the United States Navy prepared to carry out the blockade. The forces under my command, that is to say under the command of the president, are ordered to interdict subject to certain instructions contained in the proclamation, the delivery of offensive weapons and associated material to Cuba. Those are the instructions we've been given. Those are the instructions we will carry out. Across the United States, supermarket shelves were raided by anxious families, and some Americans living in large cities left their homes. Moscow ordered its submarines to protect the Soviet ships now steaming toward the blockade line 500 miles from Cuba. And in the Kremlin, Chairman Khrushchev invited U.S. businessman William Knox to his office. Chairman Khrushchev then went on to state, as the Soviet vessels were not armed, the U.S. could undoubtedly stop one or two or more. But then he, Chairman Khrushchev, would give instructions to the Russian submarines to sink the American vessels. On the blockade line, the U.S. Navy prepared to meet the Soviet ships and submarines. With nerves on edge in Washington and Moscow, even a minor skirmish at sea could have triggered explosive and unintended consequences. The president met with the chief of naval operations, Admiral George Waldo Anderson. Finally, the president sent for the Joint Chiefs, told us the decision he'd made, he said, this is up to the Navy. And I said, Mr. President, the Navy will not let you down. The Navy's standard procedure for locating and tracking enemy submarines was to drop small explosives near the subs, listen for their sonar echoes, and then follow them until they surfaced. Six Soviet submarines were located and brought to the surface in this dangerous game of cat and mouse. Concerned that the military's standard operating procedure could, by itself, provoke a clash, Defense Secretary McNamara visited Admiral Anderson. It was late in the afternoon. McNamara and Gilpatrick came down from, from their offices and Office of Secretary of Defense down to the Navy Department, uh, you might call it the war room. And he started going into the situation in great detail. 
He started asking questions. And I asked uh, George Anderson, Admiral Anderson, the chief of naval operations, uh, uh, what he proposed to do when that ship uh, reached this uh, imaginary line, the quarantine line. He said, well, we propose to stop it. Well, I said, that's clear, George, but how are you going to do it? Well, he said, we'll use our customary methods. I said, what are those? Well, he said, we'll hail it. I said, what language will you hail it in? Well, he said, uh, how the hell do I know? Uh, I, I said, I guess we'll hail it in English. He said, well, I suppose you hail it in English and they don't speak English. What are they going to do? He said, well, we'll fire a warning shot across their bow. I said, what if they don't stop then? He said, we'll fire a shot through their rudder. He said, what kind of a vessel is that? He said, it's a tanker. I said, what are you going to, what will happen if you fire a shot through the rudder? Well, he said, might catch on fire, might miss a little bit, might catch on fire. Well, I said, so let me tell you something, George. We don't, we're not trying to start a war. We're trying to convey a message, a political message. There'll be no shot fired by anybody. Do you understand that? Is that clear to you? He said, yes, sir. I walked out of the room. Now, that was a rather harsh way of conveying the message that control would remain in the hands of the president. On the Atlantic, U.S. fighters and reconnaissance planes tracked Soviet ships approaching the blockade line. Anxious to ensure that war would not break out through accident or overzealousness, President Kennedy, a former PT boat skipper, took personal command of the blockade operation. As push came to shove, President Kennedy had taken over the line to the lead ship, our ships, down at the blockade. And he was on the phone and they were waiting to see what questions he asked and what answers he got. All eyes on him with the one telephone holding it to his ear and asking the question and getting it described to him by phone by the commander down there. It was as quiet a moment in the Oval Office as anyone has ever seen. At 10.25 a.m. on October 24th, 12 of the Soviet ships suddenly stopped dead in the water. There was a certain note of excitement when he reported, they've stopped, the ships have stopped. Uh, well, they're not turning around yet, but they're dead in the water. The captain reports they're dead in the water. And I, of course, I can remember that everybody's breathed a r rather large sigh of relief. I think one or two ships did stop, but a lot of ships had already passed through. But there was great danger. It was actually a military action, almost a declared war. But we weren't taking any chances. We didn't want to deepen this crisis. We were looking for some compromise. A number of our ships had been ordered back. They changed their routes, but everything was already in Cuba. The missiles were in Cuba, so it was not such a big problem for us. The blockade stopped the arrival of any reinforcements, but Kennedy could not be sure that the missiles in Cuba were not already armed. In fact, there were 42 missiles and warheads already on the island. The crisis was far from over. The next morning at the United Nations, United States Ambassador Adlai Stevenson displayed the U-2 photographs to the world for the first time. Stevenson confronted Soviet Ambassador Zorin with the evidence. I'm not, I am not in an American courtroom, sir, and therefore I do not wish to answer a question that is put to me in the fashion in which a prosecutor does. In due course, sir, you will have your reply. I'm prepared to wait for my answer until hell freezes over, if that's your decision. Ambassador Zorin's decision was once again to deny the presence of Soviet offensive missiles in Cuba. But the next afternoon, away from the TV lights, the Soviets made an unorthodox attempt to resolve the crisis. The Soviet KGB chief in Washington urgently requested a lunch with ABC reporter John Scally. He said, what would you think of a solution of the crisis which would uh, 
involve first our withdrawing these missiles from Cuba and doing this under uh, United Nations inspection. Do you think that your government uh, would be interested? I said, uh, I was just a reporter and I didn't know, but it sounded to me, I said, like it was something that could be discussed. He then went on to say that, uh, could I check urgently with my high friends in the administration? While the Soviets were exploring a compromise through unofficial channels, Khrushchev sent Kennedy a teletyped message. Mr. President, we and you ought not to pull on the ends of the rope in which you have tied the knot of war. Because the more the two of us pull, the tighter that knot will be tied. And a moment may come when that knot will be tied so tight that even he who tied it will not have the strength to untie it. It was a, a yards long teletype, a phenomenal teletype. It was a teletype written by a man under tremendous emotion, as in a sense this, this paragraph uh, implies. It, it was clearly written by Khrushchev himself. It expressed his deep, I'll call it deep fears and deep concerns, but fears and concerns, but also determination. It was distraught and emotional and suggested that maybe the old man was losing his cool. And uh, we didn't like the, the thought that someone whose finger was on the nuclear trigger was, was uh, losing his cool. So we were left with the feeling, and I think we slept on it that night, that uh, there was both danger and hope inherent in that message. But early next morning, day 12 of the crisis, danger smothered hope. The White House received a second, much tougher message. The Soviets had raised the ante, insisting that they would remove their missiles from Cuba only if the U.S. would halt the blockade, promise never to invade Cuba, and remove its Jupiter missiles from Turkey. It was signed by Khrushchev. To remove the missiles from Turkey uh, under Soviet threat was just inconceivable. It would indicate to the Turks uh, a loss of will, a lack of will on the part of the U.S. And they would question uh, the value of our commitment to their defense. So it was inconceivable that we would yield to that threat. And yet, should we go to war over an obsolete weapon that was a pile of junk? There's a, a great danger that you will try to deal with and solve political problems with military action. With demonstrators clamoring for a resolution to the crisis, the Soviet position apparently stiffening, and the missiles still in Cuba, the Joint Chiefs of Staff recommended and prepared for military actions. A quarter million troops were moved to U.S. bases in Florida and Georgia and airlifted to Guantanamo Bay. Anti-aircraft missiles were installed on Florida beaches, and Marines practiced amphibious landings on Caribbean islands. In the event of an invasion, the Southern Expeditionary Force would be commanded by Major General William Fairborn. My orders were to land on the coast of Cuba, seize Santiago, and march on Havana. The troop movement served a dual purpose, as military preparations and signals of political determination. We loaded whole blood and a hundred coffins onto the carrier Iwo Jima dockside in Panama and uh, made sure that there was a good audience to see it. And then we sailed. The military did not know that the Soviets had nine tactical nuclear missiles in Cuba which could have been used against American Marines. But Kennedy and his advisors did know that several of the Soviet ballistic missiles could be launched against the U.S. We were fearful that in the face of an air attack or in the face of a land invasion, a Cuban sergeant or a Soviet second lieutenant under that tremendous pressure, without orders, would launch a warhead against one of the metropolitan areas or several warheads. And in that event, millions of Americans would be killed and no responsible U.S. president, and no responsible U.S. Secretary of Defense would put his nation at risk 
under those circumstances, if he could possibly avoid it. But that morning, the crisis moved one step closer to a military confrontation. An American U-2 spy plane was shot down over Cuba by a Soviet surface-to-air missile. The pilot, Air Force Major Rudolf Anderson, was killed. Kennedy was forced to respond. Events were uh, beginning to create their own pressure. And once one side moves to that kind of action, as they seem to have done by shooting down the U-2 with Major Anderson in it, uh, things may get worse pretty fast. And the requirements of uh, the military enterprise can become very strong and very compelling. So there didn't seem to be very much time. Kennedy feared that the downing of the U-2, coming right after the tough new Soviet demands, meant that Moscow had deliberately fired the first shot in a superpower war. Kennedy did not know that the order to shoot had not come from Khrushchev. It was a Soviet unit acting independently, in fact, contrary to Khrushchev's orders. I know with absolute certainty that Khrushchev gave our military this command. They were not to do anything which might provoke the Americans and make the crisis more acute. The crisis was spiraling out of both leaders' control. Two hours after the downing of Major Anderson, another U-2 ran into trouble, this one over the Soviet Union. The Pentagon War Room phoned the news to Roger Hillsman. I was leaving the White House and passed Mac Bundy's office in the basement, and an aide grabbed me and, and said my office was on the phone, and the guy was talking to me, said, I've got a phone to you and I've got a phone to the War Room in the Pentagon, I can hear the pilot of a U-2 who is strayed from a mission over the North Pole gathering air samples, and he's over the Soviet Union, the MiGs are scrambling, and he's screaming for help, and I can hear him. So I put the phone down and ran upstairs to the president, and he was in Mrs. Lincoln's office with the president and Mac Bundy, and I blurted out this news, and of course there was this terrible silence, because everybody thought, oh my God, the Soviets are going to think that we've sent a reconnaissance plane in preparation for a preemptive strike. Maybe this is the war. Well, coming on top of the shooting down of, of Major Anderson, it was just one more thing we felt the fates were conspiring against us. The U-2 made it back safely. But by the end of Black Saturday, the president and his advisors were exhausted and disheartened. Some thought that war was inevitable. I remember leaving the White House at the end of that Saturday. It was a uh, beautiful fall day. And thinking, uh, that might well be the last sunset I saw. Saturday evening, fearful that an uncontrollable military confrontation might be imminent, Kennedy sent his brother to meet Soviet Ambassador Dobrynin. Kennedy was willing to move toward Khrushchev's proposition. If the Soviets removed their missiles from Cuba, the United States would promise never to invade the island. Kennedy also instructed his brother to give Dobrynin a secret assurance. And the president authorized Bobby to convey to the Soviet Union through Dobrynin but in total confidence, the fact that the president had decided long ago to remove our missiles from Turkey, that we could not do it now publicly at the point of a gun that would uh, undermine the alliance, but that uh, they had uh, his assurance that those missiles uh, in Turkey uh, would be removed. In offering Khrushchev a carrot, Kennedy also brandished a stick. If the Soviets would not agree to his deal within 48 hours, or if another U.S. plane were shot down, the United States would go ahead with its plans to invade Cuba. And secretly, in these dark hours, Kennedy began to formulate a fallback plan, a public exchange of the missiles in Turkey for the missiles in Cuba, even though it might have disastrous effects on the alliance. I'm having dinner with the president when Bobby returned. And all the news is bad. I continue to eat nervously while the two brothers are discussing the, this terrible situation. And finally they had finished and I continue to eat nervously. 
unaware that, that uh, the conversation had stopped, and then I heard that great voice, the president said, Dave, you are eating the chicken and drinking the wine like it is your last supper. And I looked up embarrassed and said, Mr. President, after listening to you and Bobby, I'm not so sure it isn't. In the Kremlin, Khrushchev knew that he was losing control of events in Cuba. He was also told that Kennedy was under severe pressure from the military to act. If another U.S. plane were shot down, it might trigger a clash neither wanted. We were informed that Robert Kennedy said that the president himself did not know how to get out of the situation. The military was exercising great pressure on him, forcing him to resort to military action toward Cuba. He feared that despite his will, the irretrievable could occur. We could see we had to reorient our position swiftly. Sunday, October 28th, the 13th day of the crisis. In a dramatic gesture, Khrushchev accepted Kennedy's offer. The world pulls back from the nuclear brink. Radio Moscow broadcast the news first. This is Radio Moscow. Premier Khrushchev has sent a message to President Kennedy today. The Soviet government has ordered the dismantling of weapons in Cuba, as well as their creating and return to the Soviet Union. After nearly two weeks of almost unbearable tension and fear, Kennedy's and Khrushchev's ability to compromise brought the crisis to an end. And now I'm rushing over to meet the president because we are going to mass. And as he stepped into the White House car, he said, Dave, this morning we have an extra reason to pray, and we sure as hell did. The announcement about the withdrawal was came early in the morning. And I was uh, in the elevator with, our, with my colleague from Tas Vasiliev. He's now in the United States. And we talked to some lady. And she says, oh, you have listened to the news, she asked us. I said, yes, and we are Russians. Oh, she said, has, uh, reason has prevailed as speaking Russian. This was her fir our first reaction from the American side. I think it did. Of course, when this news arrived, because they arrived here on the 28th, that's a fact, they produced great indignation because we felt we became some sort of bargaining chip. It was a decision without consultation. Castro, who had put his nation at the greatest risk, did not play any role in the negotiations. He was not even kept informed. For him, the deal was principally an exchange of missiles in Cuba for missiles in Turkey, serving the interests of the Soviet Union more than Cuba. And we heard over the radio on the 28th that there had been an agreement. The retreat to Moscow. Russian ships steam out from Cuban ports with their decks loaded with missiles the Soviets are withdrawing under pressure from the New World. Soon the missiles were on their way back to Moscow, and within six months, as promised, the U.S. Jupiter missiles were removed from Turkey. The severity of the crisis prompted the superpowers to take other steps toward lessening tensions. A telex hotline was installed between Washington and Moscow. And in 1963, the United States, the Soviet Union, and Great Britain signed a landmark treaty banning nuclear explosions in the atmosphere, the first such agreement in the nuclear age. But the arms buildup continued on both sides, with the Soviet Union determined to achieve nuclear parity with the United States. The nuclear arms race sapped the economic strength of both powers and contributed to the Soviet Union's demise. Cuba, however, is still communist. To many, the country is an anachronism, left over from the Cold War and due for a massive change as soon as Castro is gone. The Cuban Missile Crisis was the closest the superpowers have ever come to nuclear war. Over the ensuing months and years, the key players have analyzed its causes and its course. 
I think looking back in Cuba, what is of concern is the fact that both governments were so far out of contact, really. I don't think that we expected that he would put the missiles in Cuba because it would have seemed such an imprudent action for him to take, as it was later proved. Now, he obviously uh, must, have thought, must have thought he could do it in secret and that the United States would accept it so that uh, he uh, did not uh, judge our intentions accurately. Well, now, if you look at the history of this century, where World War I really came through a series of uh, misjudgments of the intentions of others, certainly World War II, when you look at all those misjudgments which brought on war, and then you see the Soviet Union and the United States so far separated in their beliefs, and you put the nuclear equation into that uh, that uh, struggle, uh, that's what makes this, as I said before, such a dangerous time and that we must proceed with the firmness and also with the best information we can get and also uh, with, uh, with care. That same month, at his villa on the Black Sea, Khrushchev revealed his feelings about the Cuban Missile Crisis to the editor of Saturday Review magazine, Norman Cousins. Uh, Khrushchev was very somber as he spoke about it. He said that I get nightmares when I think how close we came. And suddenly he said I had this terrible responsibility. Was I going to try to, out of pride, just to determine, just to demonstrate to the world that the Soviet Union could stand up to the United States? Was that decision going to result in the destruction of my country and your country. He said it was insanity. Well, there are lots of lessons in the Cuban Missile Crisis, but if I had to pick out... Uh, Many of the participants in the Cuban Missile Crisis have reflected on the lessons they learned in 1962. It is clear that nuclear weapons do not lend themselves to brinksmanship. The avoidance of uh, a situation in which the game takes control is of enormous importance in any situation which has a risk of direct conflict. Give your opponent an out. Look at the crisis from his point of view. I don't mean to say be weak, that's not my point at all. But my point is look at the crisis from his point of view. Look at the options that you are considering from his point of view. Try to pick an option that achieves your purpose at minimal cost to him, political, military, otherwise to him, that avoids pushing him into an emotional uh, frame of mind in which he is likely to lash out irrationally with great cost to him and you. If the United States lacks security, it will be dangerous both for us and for the United States. The same thing is true if you put things vice versa. I think the primary lesson that we learned from the Cuban Missile Crisis, and I hope it's learned on both sides, is that we must try our best to prevent such crises from arriving on the scene because they're just too utterly dangerous. You see, uh, we and the Russians should not play games of chicken with each other to see how far one might go in a particular adventure without crossing that lethal line into nuclear war. In Havana, Cuba, there is a curious memorial to the crisis, the empty shell of a ballistic missile. Last January, a number of participants and students of the crisis gathered here, including Robert McNamara, Soviet Ambassador Alexander Alexeyev, and the son of Nikita Khrushchev. During the conference, it became clear just how imperfect their understanding of the situation had been and how big a part chance had played. As the former enemies posed for a photograph, the irony was inescapable. The world has changed dramatically since 1962, but it was not changed with weapons. Just how well do we know the next president? Wednesday at 9, we invite you to join us for a special Election 92 report that chronicles the public careers and private lives of George Bush and Bill Clinton. Join us for Frontline, Wednesday at 9.